والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, I send peace and blessings to all of the prophets. I ask Allah to have mercy on them and their families and all those who call to their way to the day of judgment. And I begin with the greeting words of the righteous. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In the year 1000 AD, Cordoba, known as Qurtaba, was the largest city on earth. And it is said by historians that this city contained over 200,000 houses, 600 mosques, 900 public baths, 50 hospitals. It was an amazing city. And along with Toledo, Seville, Granada, and Valencia, Cordoba was one of the leading centers of learning in the world. It is even said that a huge lunar water clock was in Toledo and it was the first time that anybody used uh, an instrument such as this. And so the word was spread through the writings of historians and through the words of travelers that uh, Andalusia or Al Andalus was the most populous, cultured, industrious, land in Europe for centuries. This was a special title and this was uh, a level that Muslims were able to reach in a pinnacle of civilization at this time in history. But after generations of people who were striving for their faith and building their society, the future generations began to forget. And the great historian Ibn Khaldun in his Muqaddama has put together an understanding of what happens in the cyclical or the cycle uh, rotation of time. And that is that in history generally you find the first generations hardy and strong and struggling for their cause. But their children's children begin to forget. After that generation many of the early values are lost. And so similarly, in Al-Andalus, corruption started to appear. In the architecture, we start to see uh, idols and pictures and things that did not appear in the early generations. We start to find people using wealth in a way that was unheard of in the beginning of this mighty empire. It is reported that one of their leaders, Al-Mansur, went to the stage of building himself a palace, a Zahira, outside of Cordoba. And he built it in such a way that he wanted it to be greater than any other palace that ever existed. And it was known to have a huge lake uh, that was literally thousands of meters wide. And in this lake, were petals topped with gold and a palace in the middle. And it is reported by the historians that Al-Mansur on one occasion went to the middle of this beautiful man-made lake and when he looked around something touched his heart and he began to cry. And he prayed that this Azahira, this palace would never leave him. He prayed that he would always be able to enjoy uh, such a state. But a wise man from the great scholars visited the palace and exclaimed, O palace of the kings, every house in this country 
has contributed to your ornament and perfection. You will also, when in ruins, give materials to every house. And so it was, a civil war broke out, and the beautiful structure, the beautiful palace, was brought down, and the pieces of the palace, the marble, the porcelain, it was used to build the houses of the masses of the people throughout Al-Andalus. And so corruption appeared in the land. Division also appeared amongst the leadership. And it is reported that instead of functioning under one state, a khilafat, that small kingdoms developed called ta'ifa or tawa'if. And these kingdoms were each ruled by an emir. Each person thought that he was Amir al-Mu'minin, that he was the greatest of the leaders in Al-Andalus, and it caused a confusion when Muslims did not respect their central leadership. Also, tribal, tribalism stalked the land. The Arabs started to look down on the non-Arab. White started to feel superior to black. Persian people, Turkish people, did not feel at home in the land of Andalusia. And so, new life was needed. And by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, revivalist movements entered into Al-Andalus in waves. The first wave came around 1086, when Al-Mu'tamid, one of the famous rulers, brought in Yusuf ibn Tashfin, rahimahullah, from Al-Andalus, who was the head of a large movement called Al-Murabitun. Al-Murabitun came into Spain and they were able to revitalize the society and bring it back to its central organization. Following this, around the year 1146, Al-Muwahidun, who were led by Amir Abdul Malik, also revitalized Al-Andalus. But it never returned to the original uh, beauty and organization that it had. The Trinitarian army, the, uh, the army of those who believed in three gods, began to conquer Spain. And they went from the north and started to conquer village by village, section by section, until only Granada remained. Granada, which is in the south, is a natural stronghold and protection for the Muslims. Granada was located in the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And because of this mountain range and strategic position, Muslims were able to seek refuge in Granada and were able to stay within that valley for a long period of time. Following this, the other parts of Spain were living in destruction. It is said by the year 1412 that Muslims were reduced to slavery in most of Spain. Over a hundred thousand books were burnt from different libraries. But resistance also appeared. And Muslims recognized that they had to either fight to stand for their religion or to make hijrah, to migrate to the land where they could continue to live in their faith. And so this struggle continued for a long period of time until finally in the year 1492, the last emir of Spain, Abu Abdullah, who was known as Boabdil, he signed a treaty with the Catholic uh, king and queen, and this treaty was based upon the fact that the Muslims would live under the Trinitarians, but they would be allowed to maintain their masjids, and their madrasas, their women would be safe, their basic culture would be safe. He signed the treaty in 1492, and within 10 years, the masjids were destroyed. The madrasas were obliterated. The women were raped, and everything changed. Islam then was officially banned, and Muslims tried hard to hide their identity, a new group of people started to develop. People who were appearing to be non-Muslim, but yet 
they were actually Muslim on the inside. And this is a phenomenon that appeared in Spain, in, in Al-Andalus, in such a way as we have never seen it before anywhere else in the Muslim world. It is reported that because of this forced conversion into Christianity, Muslims who could not take the pain and punishment of torture were forced to claim on the outside that they were Christians and on the inside maintain their Islam. In the year 910 after the Hijrah, about 1504 AD, a fatwa appeared from the Mufti Ahmed ibn Juma al-Maghrawi, who was an Andalusian living in Morocco. And this fatwa is, is so emotional and it is so deep, it, it, it touches on a topic that very few fatwas have ever even entered. He said to the people of Al-Andalus, I understand and I recognize your patience. And I praise you for what you have done. But I remind you of your duties. Even though you have been forced out of your religion superficially, even though you say that you are a Catholic, you should remain in Islam, you should retain your faith. And so he gave them uh, a set of principles. He gave them a system how to function as a Muslim who is hidden in a non-Muslim disguise. He said to them, because you are being tortured, because you are under threat, you can't make salat. You can't practice your Islam because if they find you, they'll burn you at the stake. And so when you make your salat, make it with your eyes. He said, when you pay zakat, just give it as a gift. Find somebody who is poor and needy in the categories of zakat and give him hadiyah. Just give him a gift. Make the intention for zakat. If you have janaba, if you are unclean ceremonially and you need to take a ghusl, a bath, then swim in a lake, dive into the ocean and say bismillah before you dive. If you can't find water and you need to make tayammum as you walk down the street, tap the wall. That is your tayammum. If you are forced to bow to an idol, then bow down. You have no choice. But inside yourself, recognize it is haram. Your heart should be, should be mutma'in bil iman. Inside of yourself, you should be reassured of your faith. If you are forced to eat pork, now imagine the level that they went to. If you are forced to eat pork, then eat it. But know on your inside that this is haram. If you are forced to marry the people of the book, then marry them, because within Islam it is permissible to marry Ahlul Kitab. But if you are forced to marry your daughter to one of them, then you should know inside what you have done is haram. Even if you are forced to say, Kalimatul Kufa. If you are forced to say the word of disbelief, if you are forced to insult and curse the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then do it because you have to. But know on your inside it is a haram act that you have done. Keep your faith inside. He did this in tradition, in the tradition of the Prophet ﷺ with Ahmad ibn Yasir and the family of Yasir, radiallahu anhum who suffered in Mecca, but their hearts were reassured with faith. Let us take a break for a moment and then come back to this trying time for Muslims in the fall of Al-Andalus. <laughs> If you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the mufassirin were trying to find out where are these seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. The, the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to not only the 20th century, the true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth.
Muslims who were living in Al-Andalus found after a rule of about 200 years that they started to lose their territory. When corruption appeared in the land, when divisions between Muslims based on their race, based on their tribe, based on their language, when this came in the ranks of the believers, the enemies of Islam were able to attack from all sides. And so the beautiful Andalusia, the beautiful garden that would bear fruit many times during the year, started to lose its former glory. And it is reported that refugees were pouring out of Al-Andalus and spreading all over the Muslim world. Refugees went to North Africa, to the Middle East, to Turkey, even in Malaysia and Indonesia. There are places that up until now are recognized by Andalusian names. So the Muslims were forced to flee out of this country. One of the main reasons for this was a terrible system that was known as the Spanish Inquisition. During this terrible period which began in 1483, the Inquisition was a type of test that was put on by religious authorities. During this test they would take a person and they would put you in front of the Inquisitor. The Inquisitor would ask you questions. If you said that you were a Muslim or you were Jewish, then they would take you outside and burn you at the stake. If you said, I'm not a Muslim, then they would test you to see if you responded in a positive way to the word Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or if, you, if your eyes lit up when they said Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Any inkling of Islam was a straight sentence of death. And it is reported in one of the cases of the Spanish Inquisition, as a woman named Elvira, a pregnant woman. Her sin was that she did not eat pork. Her sin was that she changed her linens on Saturday. So because of this, she was tortured with her child until they realized that she wasn't a Muslim. And so they began to watch the people coming from the southern part of Spain. They used to spy upon the Muslims. If you took a bath on Thursday night or on Friday morning, if you put perfume on your clothing, imagine this, you are a Catholic, but you take a bath on Thursday night, which could be Juma, or a bath on Friday morning, or you wear clean clothes on Friday, they would take you and burn you at the stake. You could not fast. You could not show anything. And so, people were forced to accept another way of life. It is reported that this genocide actually affected over 2 million Jews. Over 3 million Muslims were exiled from Al-Andalus and hundreds and thousands were killed and burnt at the stake. But Muslims resisted this and there are many stories of strong resistance against this oppression. So the Muslims who were known as the Moors, and they use this word Moor, which is from Moros, in Spanish is dark-skinned. The Moors, who accepted Christianity, who were living in a servile manner, were first called Mudajjar, or Mudajjal. And this means a servile, domesticated person. Mudajjal, like Dajjal, is an imposter. Later on, the name changed, and a person who, who went through the baptism and actually became a Christian was known as Moresco. So the Muslims were called Morescos. This is a Christian Moor or a Christian Muslim, and the Jews were called Morenos. And the Morescos and the Morenos were forced to wear special clothes, and they had to have badges on their clothes saying who they were, and they had separate facilities throughout the country. Muslims, of course, could not take this. And inside their hearts, they wanted to resist. And so there are many stories of people standing up for their faith and fighting to their death. There are also many stories of hijrah, of migration, of Muslim exiles who left Andalusia and went to North Africa 
and other parts of the Muslim world. In many cases, especially in North Africa, the Muslims became the Barbary pirates, who were actually Muslims on the sea who were taking revenge for what happened to them in Spain, and they would attack the Spanish and Portuguese ships as they carried cargo along the Straits and through the Mediterranean. Also, the early explorers and conquerors who went out of Portugal and Spain were using Muslims in their galleys. And so, if they caught any of the Barbary pirates, the punishment was to work in the galleys of a Spanish ship or a Portuguese ship for maybe two or three years. If they found Morescos or Morenos, who they didn't want in the country, the punishment was exile, you work in the boats. So Christopher Columbus and uh, Magellan and Balboa and Vasco da Gama, all of the Portuguese and Spanish uh, conquistadores, conquerors known as explorers, actually carried with them large amounts of Muslims who were hiding their identity. Christopher Columbus, in July 31st, 1502, makes another strange report. And this shows the presence of the Moresco people and the Muslims in the New World. He said that they were traveling in the Caribbean region and they saw a boat about 40 feet long that looked like a Moorish ship. There were 40 men and women on the boat. The men had colored half sleeve shirts like the ones that were worn in Granada. And the women had a niqab, had a type of veil over their faces, as the women of Granada used to wear. This is clear proof of the presence of Muslims and Morescos in the New World. This is clear proof that something else was going on beside what we know as the conquest or the opening up of the New World. Another report which is interesting in 1566, the Spanish established in St. Elena in South Carolina a colony. It was later taken uh, by the British, but what is important is that around this time, the people who were living in St. Elena, who were originally Spanish people, again the Portuguese Spanish coming over on the boats, they, when falling under the attack of the English, their people are reported to have fled into the mountains of North Carolina. In 1586, Sir Francis Drake, with 30 ships, raided the shores of Brazil. He freed 300 Moorish and Turkish galley slaves. When he reached the coast of America, the Roanoke Island, he was asked by the British people on the island to take them back to uh, Great Britain, and he let the, the Turks and the Moorish people go on the shore. Where did they go? They also went into the mountains. In 1654, it, a report comes of bearded Portuguese people. This comes from American sources of bearded, what they call Portuguese people, who worked in silver mines. They were silversmiths, and they would drop to their knees many times per day praying. In 1784, Tennessee Governor John Sevier met Moorish Portuguese people. He puts it in his writings. In the 1700s, Jonathan Swift, an Englishman, married one of them, and he called them Mecca Indians. The name that starts to come up is a name called Melungeons. And a recent publication, which comes out of America, shows the Melungeons, and it speaks of the Melungeons, and it talks about the resurrection of a proud people, and it also mentions an untold story of ethnic cleansing in America. The author is N. Brent Kennedy. He is a Melungeon uh, person known as Portug Portuguese or Geechee. These people are well known in the South, living all along the coast, South Carolina, North Carolina, and especially up in the Appalachian Mountains. They were mistreated. They were forced into the worst territory. But when N. Brent Kennedy did this work, he found that there was something different about him. He recognized something within his traditions. 
and in 1990, Dr. James Guthrie did blood samples of over 177 melungeons, and he found that it was the same genetic makeup as people of North Africa, especially Morocco, Algeria, Libya, also the people of Iraq, the people of Spain, Cyprus, Malta, and of course, Turkey. In Turkish, melungeon means a person whose life has been cursed. And so it appears that they gave themselves this name because they felt that they were cursed. They were forced out of their lands and they were forced it way into the backwoods and mountains, not able to benefit from their people or their culture. But these Melungeon people are now living all over the United States. And um, it is reported that Melungeons actually made great contributions to history. N. Brent Kennedy, in looking at the presence of Melungeons in the South, did a study and he said that anybody coming out of the Carolinas, out of the Appalachia region, of any race, that means if the person is European or white, if they're Native American, the Red Indians, if they're African American, uh, if they are Gichi or Portuguese, or Portuguese, any of these groups with the following names, then more than likely uh, they are Melungeons. Some of the names are as follows. Adams, Adkins, Bell, Bennett, Berry, Bowling, Chavis, Coleman, Collins, Gibson, Goins, Hall, Jackson, Lopez, Moore, Mullins, Nash, Robinson, Sexton and Williams. Anybody bearing one of these names is more than likely a Melungeon. That means this person is more than likely a descendant of Muslims who had to hide their identity, who were used as galley slaves and who came into America and became part of the changing American society. Another shocking bit of information is that the wife of the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. His wife's name was Nancy Hanks, and she was a Melungeon. Another bit of information for our younger generation, and for those who are following music and pop, is that Elvis Presley was a Melungeon. Despite the infamous life of Elvis, and despite what the world might say about Melungeons, Muslims have played an important role in American society and throughout this world. I leave you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.